work it, make it, do it, make sense. Welcome to the presentation on uh, uh, transactional actors using uh, software transactional memory and uh, Eclipse Vertex. Um, my name is Mark Little. I'm uh, JBoss CTO, VP at uh, Red Hat, and I'm going to be presenting the first half, and my colleague, uh, Mike Mosgrove, who's sat in the front here, uh, he's going to be doing the really interesting bit. He's actually going to be showing you how this stuff works and taking you through some, um, some live coding or at least some live, some live demos. Um, and this is his laptop, not mine, so bear with me if I go in the wrong direction. Okay, so um, we're going to be covering briefly uh, the actor model, uh, ag and again briefly on transactions and software transactional memory, because I want to try and get to the, the meat of the presentation, which is really the, the code walkthrough. Uh, we'll touch on Vertex, we'll touch on the software transactional memory implementation that we're using, which is uh, based on the, uh, the JBoss uh, Nariana uh, project. And um, then, like I say, we've got code walkthrough, and Mike's got, uh, he's got four demos. If we get through all four, four that's great. Uh, but I'd, you know, I'd like to at least get through uh, one of them and leave some time for anybody who has any questions. And if you have any questions while we're going through it, you know, just shout out and we'll try and uh, accommodate them. So before we actually dive into what this talk <laughs> is, I thought it was important to tell you what the talk is not. Uh, there is, there's not time to do everything we'd like to do in terms of showing you how you can actually develop uh, transactional actors with Vertex and give you a survey of the actor model. We're not going to give you a survey of uh, transactions or distributed transactions. Um, both of those are, you know, at least hour-long uh, presentations in themselves. It's not going to be a tutorial on Vertex. We've had a number of um, uh, the Red Hat Vertex team here over the last couple of days giving various presentations. Hopefully, some of you may have been in those. And it's not going to be a tutorial on Nariana because that, again, is a, is a large project. It's been around in one form or another since uh, 1987. Uh, and we could fill three or four days just talking about some of some aspects of it. Uh, but hopefully it still is going to be useful. If you want to hear any of these, uh, hear details about anything that it's not, you know, you can grab us, uh, and there's, you know, if you do a Google search, you'll find lots of presentations that we and others have given over the years on, uh, on these different bullets. Okay, so the actor model has actually been around for a, a long time, uh, since the, the 1980s. Uh, well, actually, no, since the 1970s. Uh, there's another model called Communicating Sequential Processes, CSP, uh, which was defined by Hoare, um, and that was in the 1980s. There are a number of different implementations of the actor model. Uh, you know, I even on the JVM, there's, um, you know, ACA, um, which is based on, you know, written in Scala. Um, it's, over the years, it's a very, very popular way of thinking about and designing concurrent distributed applications. The little uh, diagram at the, at the edge there is to try and give you an idea that th you have actors which are single-threaded and they, can, they receive messages. They have, um, they have mailboxes where a message comes in. They do the work to find on the that is defined in the in the message, and then you know they they send a, another message maybe as a response, and then if there's nothing else in the mail queue, then they'll go to sleep and wait for another message to come in. And actors only communicate through message passing. There is no shared state, direct shared state in the actor model. If you want to share state, you'll send an send an email or send a message and say this is what my state is, and then the uh, you know the other actor that received it can look at it and then know that at least when the message was sent, that is what your state is. Um, one of the reasons that uh, things like Actor and CSP have, have been very, very popular, like I said, is they are a really good way of thinking about distributed systems at scale as well. Uh, many universities have been teaching CSP for, for decades, and you know, maybe some of you guys in, in the room have actually learned about it at university, if not at, at work. Uh, so that was ac the Actor model in a nutshell. Now we'll move on to uh, software transactional memory. Um, so before we jump into that, 
uh, we'll give a quick overview of, of tra transactions or distributed transactions, as some people like to call them. If you've used databases, you will have come across transactions. Typically, they're called local transactions in a, in a database. Uh, transactions tend to have what are known as ACID properties, which is uh, an acronym for, at for atomicity, consistency, isolation, and durability. I'm not going to cover each of these in detail, um, but it's important to at least cover a, a little bit of context. So in order to get uh, atomicity, uh, there is a, a, a requirement uh, between multiple participants in a transaction to have a consensus protocol. The, a transaction, essentially, everything happens in the transaction if the transaction completes successfully, or nothing happens. You never get partial completion in a transaction. And to do that, you need all the participants in that transaction to agree that they are going to move forward and commit the state. And if one of them decides it can't, then everybody has to undo. And one way of thinking about that, uh, and there are multiple ways, but the marriage ceremony. Those of you who are married or even thinking about being married, you know, whether you're Homer Simpson or Marge, um, the marriage ceremony is essentially a two-phase commit protocol. You have the, the vicar. <coughs> who is the coordinator, and he asks the you know the bride and the groom sequentially, do you want to marry this person? And they'll say yes. And at that point, they are neither single nor married. They're in this indeterminate state because the vicar, the coordinator, has not told them whether they are married or whether they're just gonna everything's over and done with, and we're all gonna go back. Then they go on to the bride and say, you know, do you want to marry this person? And the bride says yes. Then the vicar will, you know, hopefully write down something in case there's a catastrophic failure and he can remember where he was when the church gets rebuilt. And then he goes around and says to everybody, right, you're married. And that's it. So that's a two-phase commit protocol. The thing about writing down is very, very important because shit happens. Failures happen. And, you know, okay, taking the analogy to an extreme, as I said, you know, there could be a catastrophic earthquake, the vicar could die or be struck with, uh, you know, short-term memory loss and not remember where things were, and the two participants could have different views of where, where the thing was, uh, you know, whether they're married or not married, uh, and that's what writing this, this uh, information down does. It, that is what is commonly known in the transaction world as the transaction log. So if anybody asks you if you know about two-phase commit, now you can say you do, and it's just the marriage ceremony. Um, durability, touched on this. The log aspect is really, really important because we have to have this uh, ability to be able to undo or move forward even, the ev even in the event of failures. So there's a transaction log, and the participants have to remember as well. So technically, what I should also have said is that Homer and Marge are supposed to write down a little bit of paper in case they have short-term memory loss as well. And that would be their versions of the logs. And then we have isolation. Uh, I'm, I say I'm not going to cover all the ACID properties, but isolation is, uh, can be Im imposed in a number of different ways. A typical way is locking. So you know, if you've got multiple resources being accessed in the scope of the same transaction, you might get a read lock on something to prevent somebody else trying to write it while you are reading it. And obviously, the typical uh, rule is you can have multiple readers on a resource or, or state within the scope of a transaction, but only a single uh, writer. So software transactional memory uh, is a relatively new thing. Hardware transactional memory has been around for you know, almost 40 years now. Uh, and uh, it's actually been very successful. And there are a, a number of different implementations of hardware transactional memory that are in widespread use today. Software transactional memory was first proposed, uh, I can never remember the name, in a, in a PhD uh, and then subsequently in a number of papers in around about 1995. And despite the fact that that's only like 30 years ago, and you might think, well, 30 years in software is a long time, everything should be done and dusted, uh, it's still a very, very active area of research. Um, it's used, uh, it, well, software transactional memory, if you, if you do a Google search and find the original paper, you'll find that one of the reasons that it was posited was to make it easy to develop uh, to develop transactional applications. Transactions are really good, but sometimes it can actually be hard to develop with them and to use them. Software transactional memory tries to make it so damn easy to use transactions that you don't even think about the fact that you're using transactions. Um, there's, you know, 
the notion of accessing shared state, again, you know, I mentioned earlier, that's traditional transactions as well. You know, you share your state in a database, you might have distributed objects and share distributed object state. So software transactional memory doesn't actually, um, didn't actually add that, that was there for uh, before that. But it makes accessing shared state and using shared state in a software transactional memory environment uh, a lot simpler than it can be in, uh, in traditional transactional um, frameworks. Um, all code inside software transactional atomic blocks is um, you know, serial and no other threads can access the state uh, that is um, being accessed by some other threads within, that, um, within those blocks if they conflict. And, and some implementations of software transactional memory in lots of different languages, so this isn't Java specific, um, will support locks. They ne don't necessarily support locks to do concurrency control. They might also do uh, timestamp based uh, um, concurrency. And they'll, they can also support optimistic and, and pessimistic modes of, uh, of development. So hopefully, you know, some of this is similar to what, if any of you have used transactional systems over the last few decades, ignoring software transactional memory, some of this should actually be very, very familiar to you, hopefully. Um, so transactions and actors have actually gone together quite, quite well for a number of years. Almost as soon as a software transactional memory at, um, came out, people were thinking about how can I add this to, to actors. And even before software transactional memory, back in the, uh, the early 90s, uh, well, late 80s and early 90s, when distributed objects were kind of like the norm and people were doing work with Corba uh, and even DCE before it, people were looking at how you can combine the transactional programming model with the actor programming model. Because, you know, despite the fact that actors are single-threaded, uh, an actor may go through multiple state changes upon receipt of a message in, it, in its mailbox. Uh, and, you know, failures can happen. So one of the nice things about transactions, as I said earlier, is that the work you do within the scope of a transaction, the transaction system will ensure that if there is a failure halfway through, you get back to a known good state. That will be undone, and you can start again. So even if that is a failure you've never even thought could possibly happen, like somebody comes along and pulls the power out of the, uh, the wall, you don't have to program against that. As long as you're using transactions, the system will take care of it. And when the, when the recovery happens and your application starts running again, you can start again and try, try the same thing again, maybe, or try an, an alternative. So there's, there's been a need for combining transactional model with actors for quite a while. Uh, because consistency of state changes, it doesn't matter whether you're using an actor model or, or a non-actor model, it's very, very, <coughs> pardon me, it's very, very important that you know that when you're making state changes, uh, either in a single threaded environment or in an environment where you can have uh, multiple threads accessing the same state at the same time, even if they're in the same process, that there is a level of consistency uh, with or without failures. Just throwing failures into that makes, makes it even more important. So like I said, the combination of transactions and actors is, is very uh, natural and a number of people, ourselves included, believe that the combination of software transactional memory and actors is, uh, is very natural, is even more natural, I suppose, because actors, simple programming model, software transactional memory, uh, a simpler programming model. So quickly, um, I'm going to rush through the Vertex stuff because like I said I want to give Mike uh, enough time to do some of the demos. So Vertex, if any of you have been uh, JavaScript or Node developers uh, over the years, uh, the easiest way of thinking about Vertex is it's, it's like Node, um, the Node model on the JVM with Polyglot. You can actually develop with JavaScript on the JVM with Vertex if you really want to, but you can develop with Java, with Scala, with Groovy, with um, not all of them, but I think eight, eight of the uh, popular JVM-based languages are currently supported in Vertex with a reactive uh, programming model. So there's a reactive manifesto, um, which has been around for a few years, Vertex, um, and the founder of Vertex, uh, Tim Fox, are actually uh, instrumental in helping to define um, the reactive manifest manifesto originally. And a reactive system needs to be responsive, elastic, resilient, and asynchronous. Um, and uh, I think I've said most of this, but a Vertex is because it helps you know, it's been influenced by and helped to influence the reactive manifesto. Obviously, we believe Vertex is reactive. It's extremely popular. It is non-blocking, asynchronous. Um, 
it's uh, it has a, the notion of a of an event bus um, that um, um, vertex entities called verticals can be uh, communicating with. Uh, there are different implementations of that event bus. As I said, it's already polyglot, um, and um, over the years, a number of other projects have been integrated with uh, Vertex, so things like ActiveMQ, that was added into Vertex to allow you to actually have an event bus that uh, is based on ActiveMQ. Uh, there's something uh, upstream in Apache called Cupid Dispatch Router, uh, or if you're American, Dispatch Router. Uh, that's also been integrated into Vertex. Um, Hazelcast is one of the uh, cluster uh, managers for Vertex. Uh, obviously, Given that um, JBoss and Red Hat have, in sp have InfiniSpan, we've added InfiniSpan to that. And there's integration with Spring Boot. It has a, an extremely large uh, user base and contributor uh, base. So it's not just people who take the stuff and use it, which is very important, but it's also people who contribute things to it. And uh, it's been in Eclipse for about three years now. So if you go to the Vertex website, which is vertex.io, you can see a list of all the uh, well, all the customers who have uh, allowed us to put their name on, which is, a, is actually a subset of all the customers we know are using it, but uh, as you can see, there's a there's an awful lot of on there. That's just a, a one-page thing, but there's a, there's actually an awful lot of people who are using Vertex and using it in deployment today, which I think is the important thing. Um, so Vertex provides a number of different ways in which your your uh, your entities or your verticals can communicate with each other. TCP, UDP variants of HTTP, uh, gRPC, I believe, after I was talking with Clement earlier today. I uh, mentioned there is this event bus, which is the backbone for sending and receiving messages. Uh, does distributed data structures, as I mentioned, Hazelcast and, and InfiniSpan. Uh, it has automatic load balancing, built-in resiliency, so you can actually fire up, as, as Mike will show you in a minute, you can fire up seven or eight different versions of your application to do load balancing, and Vertex will, keep em, will manage them, and if one of them goes down, it'll fire another one up just so you can uh, have the same level of resiliency. Um, so now we'll quickly go on to the, the software transactional memory. Um, so as I said, the Narayana project that software our software transactional memory uh, implementation is based upon has been around for a long time. It actually started life in C++ back in 1985. Uh, it was known as the Arjuna project back then. Uh, it became the first uh, pure Java implementation of a transaction manager back in 1996, and it's kind of morphed since then. Um, it defines a number of different uh, models, but one of the ones that we added a few years back, as I said, is software transactional memory. With, with our software transactional memory uh, model, the state is obviously within objects. We're, we're, we're talking about Java here, so we like to think about objects. So your state that's going to be manipulated, you have that within an object. Your state can be, um, your transactional state can be volatile which mean or recoverable which means that if the transaction you can do the normal things i just mentioned in transactions like assume that things can will roll back if you force a rollback but if there's a crash you lose the state any state changes you made have gone completely uh, but then there's also a possibility of having persistent or durable state changes. So that means that if you're doing things in a single threaded vertical and uh, you're making state changes and the transaction commits and then there's a crash when you recover the state that you committed is on disk and you can recover and you can get back that state. And you can combine these things. In fact, you can go from a, vo from a volatile state to a durable state and then back again if you so wish. Uh, it's not something you're going to see demonstrated here, but you, know, you can do that. There are optimistic and pessimistic models for concurrency control in the software transactional memory implementation. You can have different types of transactions. So you can have top-level transactions. You can have nested transactions. So uh, unfortunately, I do not have time to talk about nested transactions, but they're a really cool thing. And you can have nested top-level transactions. Um, I wish I could talk about that because you know, without knowing what nested transactions are, it's hard to know that nested top-level transactions are really cool. But again, you know, if you look at some of the things that you know we've we've blogged about or spoken about, you'll find that. And maybe, you know, maybe there'll be time afterwards. And it's also modular. So the transaction contexts that we have are associated with a thread. 
And if you start a transaction and that transaction flows across to other objects that decide they need to, they need to be transactional, they can quite happily create transactions without checking to see if there is already a transaction on the thread because what they'll then do is create a nested transaction which will be automatically nested. There's no special construct for a nested transaction. You just create a transaction. If there was one already running on that thread, the one you've just created is automatically nested within that transaction. Um, so it does. It makes things, like I said, makes things very modular. You, as a as a developer, can just think. I know I need this object to be manipulated with a transaction. If it gets called in a transaction, fantastic. If it doesn't, that's still okay. I'm responsible for ensuring I start and end the transactions. Um, and everything that we do in the software transactional memory world is done with uh, annotations. Um, Quickly, some context, uh, some examples that will hopefully set some context for what Mike's about to say. In the uh, in the STM world, what you essentially do is you create some what, what we call uh, transactional memory containers, um, and you define these on a per type basis. So Mike will will demonstrate this later on. But you can have like a you might create a transactional container for a for a stack, or for a theater booking system. And um, then you get transactional memory instances from that container. When you create the container, um, this is a very simplified uh, version of the container method, by the way. I basically had to cut out a lot to get on this one slide. But when you create the container, you can say, I want instances from this container to be recoverable, which, as I said, is the volatile aspect of the of state changes, or to be persistent. Uh, I want them to be shared, which means um, that you can actually access them through multiple verticals running potentially on different machines uh, in a system or exclusive, which means that nobody can, can share them uh, even if they're on the same machine and even if they're in the same uh, address space. Um, and then once you create that, then you create instances and you get back a reference to the instance to then manipulate and do all your operations on. Um, as I said earlier, we have a load of annotations, so you mark uh, the interfaces as transactional, um, and then that's the thing that the container gives you gives you back. Um, transactions can be nested, nested top level. Um, the top top level ones you don't even need to mention. Um, the, the transactions are just top level. Um, Optimistic and pessimistic annotations. Uh, if you want to set locks, you can actually set a read lock and a write lock. That's probably we probably changed the name there. I was thinking about this the other day because sometimes we don't actually use locks. It's a it's a historical reason that they call read locks and write locks at this point. You can define the state that you want saving. So the system will, as I said earlier, it's important that you know if a transaction rolls back, it can undo any state changes and give you back exactly the state you had before the transaction started. Uh, if you don't use any of these annotations in general, there's a sensible default. The default, if you don't specify what the state is, everything in the objects that you touch in the scope of transaction is, sta is saved. Well, everything that's not a final and not volatile, everything will be, sta will be saved and then everything will be restored. But you might actually want to have finer control over that. So you can say with an annotation, don't ever save this state. I don't care what you do about the rest. You can save it all, but don't ever touch this. Don't ever change it. And then you can define objects which are transaction free, which means if a thread goes into them um, a transaction and a transaction is on that thread context, then the transaction will be suspended and work will be done, but you won't ever be able to undo it if the transaction rolls back. Okay, so that was a, a whirlwind tour of, of uh, and hopefully some context of where we've got to with um, uh, software transactional memory in, in practice, well, in theory, and now Mike's hopefully going to give you uh, some practice, some examples. Good luck. Thanks, Mark. Hi, guys. My name is Mike Musgrove. I'm a developer at Red Hat to work on the transactions team. So in the second part of this demonstration, I'm going to be like um, taking Mark's, con Mark's concepts of the um, of actors and software transaction management memory. He's talked about two implementations of those two concepts, and I'm going to be showing you how to like um, write to put those and make those work in your programs. So I'm going to do it in two parts. The first part is going to be by slides. So it's going to be a code walkthrough of how to create a software transactional memory object. And then in the second part, I'm going to be running some demos. And those demos will be showing you how to use software transactional memory and how to combine them with Vertex. And I'll have some like programs running, running with that. So to create a software transactional memory object, you start off with a box standard, box standard 
Java or Java interface. So this is how you just so you've got a stock level interface, you've got getters, you've got get getters, setters, and you've got like a mutator value, a deck where you can decrement the stock stock value. And then you would have your implementation of that object. This is still not to do with software transaction memory. So it implements that that stock level interface. It's got some state there in the bottom. And it's the soft that, that state's going to be the one that's going to be managed by the software transactional memory. So first thing you have to do, and it's in fact it's the only thing you that you that you that's mandatory, is you have to mark the interface as being transactional. And what that does is it tells the STM runtime which which objects it needs to like be monitoring, which um, which which it needs to be like managing as as transactional objects. So you define that one, and then these um, you can go back to the implementation of that interface. Now you could just do nothing on this at this level. Now Mark says like, uh, that all of these like um, annotations have like very sensible defaults, and. So the default is any state that you've got in your object, any members, any fields, those are automatically state, and the container will monitor any accesses to those states. And also by default, all methods, all public methods in the interface will be, um, will be monitored um, by the cover of the container. But clearly that's pr um, probably you won't want to do that. You'll like there'll be some, some methods that you won't want to be um, have managed by the software transactional memory system. Some will be like you, it's only reading, some will be a writing. And for like, so with write locks, obviously write locks requires a, a lot more like isolation of state between different threads. So you want to make sure that you, um, that you mark up which ones are really read-only methods and which ones are write methods. So for example, the get method up there at the top, it's never going to mutate any state inside the object. So therefore, you just need to take read locks whenever you go through that method. And then at the bottom, as I said, the state. So you mark up which bits of your... Of of your object is actually state that you want to have managed by the software transactional memory runtime. So you've defined your software transactional memory object, and now you have to make it, you have to go and use it, and you have to make it available, you have to make it known to the, to the runtime, to the software STM runtime. So the way you do that is you instantiate a container, this is not an STM container, um, and that's instantiating the default container, that's going to give you like volatile, like volatile objects. Um, you, you instantiate your, your service impl your implementation of your stock level service and there you are, you've got to pass that implementation to the container and you've got to say to the container, create me a proxy for this implementation object and what you get back is something that is actually monitored by the, by the STM system so whenever you, make inter whenever you interact with that stock level object now it's the uh, software transactional memory system will know when you've been touching various bits of state and at the bottom there, so in, um, you have to bracket all of your operations within a transactional block. So software transactional memory, recall from the earlier part of the presentation, is it's like an atomic operation, and you've got to de demarcate what your atomic um, sections of code are. And you demarcate that with um, begin and end, like a standard transaction. And then you do all your mutators or your reading of objects inside that, that bracket. So I've got a comment there, is like we do have something called top, uh, nested top level annotations. And what that means is that the STM runtime will actually start a transaction for you if there isn't one already running. So even at this point here, you still don't need to start and stop transactions. So you have a really, really low barrier for entry in terms of how you can like, you know, take advantage of these things. So if you like, you know, if you're getting a, if you're experimenting with it, you can just write a very simple interface, market act transactional mark it uh, at nested um, tr top level, and then just reuse it like you would any normal Java object. And then you could play around with it and you could find out, you know, that you, know, that you can get your concurrency support, et cetera, and your safety. So that's showing you how to use STM and how to create STM objects. So the second part of it is I'm going to be going over of how you um, integrate that with Vertex and, um, and, and as a result of combining the two, you can get very scalable, scalable shared memory systems. So, so I've got four demos. I'm not sure if I'm going to get through them all, but the first demo is really probably the most important one. So I'll spend most of the time on the first demo. And if, if I find I've got time, then I can go through the rest of them. So 
So the format is what I'll do, I'll have a couple of slides on each demo, des describe what the demo is, then I'll go into the applicator, I'll, I'll go and run it, I'll go into a like, command line, run the, app, run the demonstration, talk a bit about, about what it's doing, and then after I've done that, then step back into the code and show you the code that implements that demo, so it's three parts. So the first one is um, it, it's showing you how you might want to scale your application. So you've got your application running, and you want to like, you know, be able to like, service like, a, a more workload. So you do that by you'd scale it by, um, th by adding more threads to the system. So for example, you might buy yourself a bigger box, and you can fi have more threads running your workload. So that's an example of vertical scaling. And this combination of software transactional memory and Vertex is a, is a perfect is a perfect solution for scaling in that way without having to like write complex um, complex locking code or like, um, or synchronization code between th threads. So what the example does is it's a volatile one. So volatile is it only runs in single address space. So all the threads in the address space can share can share the memory, but you can't share them between different JVMs or yeah, in, in other JVMs. It creates one service. The service the service is going to be a, a theater service. But it's going to instant. It's going to create that in the context of Vertex, and then you're going to instantiate multiple Vertex instances. And each of these vertical instances is, is like a single, a thin single thread that's, that's interacting with it, that's using that theater object, and is fielding a request to it. And the isolation between the different threads is managed by the STM system. Um, Yes, yeah, so it's uh, so I've got a single STM object. It's a theatre object, and it manages booking, so it maintains the bookings that it's made, and it lets you query the booking. So it's got a write method, and it's got a read method. So it's um, it's going to start a number of different vertical instances. Each vertical instance is going to be listening onto the same HTTP endpoint, and the vertex runtime will manage the um, the requests coming in, and it will multiplex those requests onto the various verti verti verticals that are, that are listening on on that that one endpoint. End Okay, so we just so okay, so I've got a canned um, script here. Okay, so so demo one. So first off, so I've scripted it, so I'll put them in Maven profiles. So if we take a copy of that. Okay, so I'll start that. So I'll Mavenize the, the example, the, the demo, obviously. So what that's going to do? So it's going to start. So it's, it's going to deploy a vertex vertical. Um, and then it's got that vertex vertical is then going to be running in, in. I've done it with ten instances, so there's ten there's ten threads running here, and that's just showing that it's, it's just demonstrating that there's actually ten threads in the system. And then so and that that service is now listening on an endpoint, so it's listening for theatre booking requests. So if we fire at a couple of HTTP messages requested it. Okay, so this, yes, yeah, it's going to fire a message at the um, endpoint 8080, and it's a post mes message, so it's going to ask it to create a resource, and it's going to create a theatre booking. Um, and I'll do that twice. So if you look at the output there, that's the, the JSON output, it's showing you that th which thread is serviced to that, that request, so it's thread 5 has serviced it. Run it again, and it's a different thread servicing it. So, and also in there, you've got booking counts. You can see the booking count is incrementing, so even though it's handled by different threads, they are actually seeing the same state, the same object, and then you can also issue um, get requests in a similar fashion. And you can, so yeah, so you can see that a get request is returning the booking count of two. Um, you can keep doing it again with another one, and it's different threads being handling it. So it's like demonstrating that each thread, it doesn't matter which thread is servicing the requests, it's still seeing consistent state. So that's the end of the first demonstration.
So the next, uh, oh, sorry, I was going to go through the code. Yes, that's, that's, that's kind of handy, isn't it? Okay, so, so this is the code that, that does it. So I've, sp I've separated out the code into like three, into, into a, um, a class hierarchy. So I've got three classes in the hierarchy. At the top level of the hierarchy, I've got this thing called a volatile theatre vertical, and that's the thing that does the initialization. So that's going to initialize the, um, it's going init to deploy the uh, vertex vertical, do the de deploy, and it's going to initialize your software transactional memory objects. So if you see there, the first thing it does is it's creating a container for software for the STM objects, and it's creating an STM object. And on an earlier s on the slide deck, I showed you, I showed you like you call create method on the container. You pass it an, a, a st an implementation of, of a Java object, <coughs> and it returns you back a proxy. So that line there, where it's got service equals container, so that service is now going to be a proxy, and that's and this the, S the STM runtime is going to monitor what you're going to be doing with that object. Um, this next one here is kind of a workaround for a, an issue we've got outstanding where you have to like make sure it's like um, it's 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 uh, it's it's in memory. It's been initialized properly. So once we fix that, you won't have to do that line. So that's your that's your STM configuration um, complete, and then you're going to deploy your vertical vertex instance. You're going to uh, deploy your vertex vertical, and there that's this one here is showing you. I'm going to want ten instances of it. Obviously, you can have as many as you want depending on how on how beefy your box is. Um, and then just passing a little bit of configuration through to the, through to the instances it's going to create. So Vertex will then, on this line, will then go away, deploy that vertical, see you want 10 instances, it'll spin up 10 threads, it'll call the start methods on each of the, ver on each of the verticals, um, and then it'll feed events through to it. So the next one is the theatre vertical. <coughs> so the theatre ver vertical, this is like an, um, an instance of the, of the vertical that you've just deployed that I've shown you on the previous screen. So a vertex will deploy the verticals and it will call the constructor of your vertical Im implementation, call the other, you need an empty constructor, um, and then it will call the start method. So the start method is the trigger for the, um, for, the, 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 for the vertical instance to actually start doing its work and providing service to uh, the whatever service it provides. In this case, it's just the services just listening on HTTP endpoints for theatre requests, service requests for, for theatre bookings and et cetera. So what I've shown here is the uh, STM object that was created on the previous screen in the main method, that object has to be shared between all the different instances. And the way you get that a shared object is you use a clone method. So it's a, so you you call a clone method on the so if you look at which one was it? Let's use that one. Yeah, this one's got a clone method. So I've had to put the clone method in the in the previous class because you know you, you clone it in different ways depending on whether you want volatile objects or persistent objects or depend what kind of model you want. So in this example, it's just like calling the clone method on the container. Oops, too far. Okay, so, so that's done the initialization of the instance. Um, and then the, the start server method, that's just um, starting uh, an HTTP server. So that's like a vertex thing, it's not, uh, not STM. Um, the get roots is just defining the, end, the, the, um, the paths that this server is going to be listening on. So it's going to be listening on a path for it's the API, its service name is theater. So it's going to be listening, so it's done listening for read requests on a slash API slash theater, and it's going to be listening for theater bookings, post requests on slash API slash theater, and then however many seats the, uh, the customer wants to book. Um, and that's pretty much there. So the, the, actual, the actual business logic for doing the bookings is um, is in this method here get bookings. So that's that's where the business logic will reside. 
and then there's just like the, um, the, the packaging up of the response to send back to the, to the HTTP caller. So now if we go back into this level, so I'll put that into the next, uh, into, a, into a superclass of this one. Just so I've done that to separate all the different parts of the functionality. So the deployment, the vertex initialization, STM initialization, and now the business, the business logic. So the business logic is where the domain objects reside. Um, so here's the get booking service. So I didn't tell you which object it's being passed through. Yeah, so it's passing in the cloned STM object. So this is like, uh, it's cloned because it's shared between all the different um, uh, verticals. So we go into the get booking. So the get booking object, so recall earlier we said like when you do a software transactional memory um, interactions on objects, you need to be able to like bracket those changes inside an atomic block. So here I'm showing you like, you, so you've got to start your an atomic transaction and, um, and, uh, and then you've got to begin it. And this is where your atomic block resides, so between begin through to commit. And that's the block where you're going to do, where the STM container is going to be monitoring all accesses to your STM object. In this case, the only interaction with it is to like ask it to, uh, you know, to, to it's call a read method, asking it how many bookings it's got. Um, and similarly, the make booking, that's going to be a write method. So same as the previous one, more or less, except it's going to do a book show call. So a book show, I haven't shown you actually the STM object implementation itself. So if I step through into that. Um, so this is, um, this is an, an STM object. So recall when I said it's, you start off with an interface and then you just annotate it with that transactional. And that's the trigger for the STM container to know that it needs to be monitoring. Um, monitoring all the um, calls to, to that, that interface, all the implementations of that interface. Um, and in this case, there's only one, there's, there's, the, right, the, there's, there's the right method, book show, um, and then there's a, there's, yeah, and there's, a get, there's a read method in there. So if we go back here, so... Yeah, so that's, yeah, and... Yeah, so that's, that covers the implementation of, of that first demonstration. So if anyone got any questions as, as I'm running through it, if I've skimmed over anything, just, just um, shout up. And I'll do my best to answer your questions. So the second demo is um, very similar to the first demo. The only difference is really is going to be is that it's instead of having volatile software STM objects, it's going to have persistent ones. And what a persistent one means you can do is you can share that memory across different address spaces. So you can spin up multiple JVMs and they'll all be, they'll all be seeing the same object. Um, so this so an example here of why you might want to do that is if you go on a scale out your, um, your, your, your service and you want to push it across multiple nodes, then you're better all multiple JVMs, then you better run multiple JVMs and they'll all be sharing the same the same the same data and they'll have consistent changes to that data. So back to the demo. So I'll kill the first demo off. So demo two. So I'll start that one running. And then in another, um, in another window, I'm going to start a second JVM. So I'll start it in this window. Uh, with this one, I've got to tell it which, uh, which object is going to be shared. So objects have like identi identi unique identifiers to the software transaction memory system, and those UIDs is how it knows that the, um, that the objects are being shared, which objects need to be shared with each other. So on here, I need to take a copy of the UID and I can tell this one. Okay, so, so that's now two JVMs running, both of them hosting the theater booking service. Um, each one is deployed a vertical and the vertex has deployed um, 10 instances of that vertical in each JVM. 
Um, now what we can do is issue requests, curl requests at it. So these are service requests, just like we were before. So the different JVMs, so they need to be listening on different HTTP endpoints. So this window, this one's listening on 8086, this one's listening on 8082. Yeah, 8082. So now if I issue requests at it, so now I'm creating a booking to the 8080 service in the top left-hand window. And then I'll do the same on the second JVM, give it 8082. Let's try that one. Mr. Slash, was it? Yeah. 8082, that's one. Right, okay. That's why I've got it scripted in the um, in the shell script. <laughs> okay, so, so what I've done there is I've issued two requests to make bookings. Um, and then you now if I go back and I ask for it how many bookings you've got, it doesn't matter which JVM I go to, they should report the same value back because this is a shared, a shared object and it's shared across address spaces. So if I step on here, so if I go to the war, the service listening on the 8080 endpoint, so that's reporting a booking count of three. So I've got three bookings there. And then if I go to the other JVM that's listing on 8082, then yeah, so that's giving me the same value as well. So that's showing you how to share the memory and share state across two different JVMs, um, and the JVM will manage the concurrency between them. So I'm running quite short of time now. Um, so I do have two demos like left. So yeah. So one of the so what I haven't shown in these, I, I haven't shown concurrent accesses to them. I've just like been typing at the command line, doing one uh, typing one command service request to do it at a time. So that's not concurrency. So there is one part of the demo which like will um, it'll spin up a number of vertical instances. It's probably best if I just show you actually. Well, Mike. Yeah. Four minutes. Four, just, just, just show it running. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. So, so I, I've, I'm, I haven't shown you the code for the persistent one, but if you are interested, then it's all available. It's open source, so you can go and grab it. Um, so demo three. Right, okay, so what this one is, this is a stress test. So first what we're going to do is start one of the earlier demos. So we're just going to start a service, demo one. So start running demo one, and that's doing 30 bookings. And then I've got a second example here, so it's a stress test. And that's going to start up a... It's going to start up a vertical, it's going to have like 10 instances again. So it's going to have 10 instances of this vertical, and each vertical is then going to be firing loads of like REST, uh, REST requests at this theatre service, asking it to do bookings, etc. So this should like really normally, it's like if you haven't got your concurrency right, this should cause a lot of like um, corruption. So run that one. So it's doing 100 requests, and it's fired there, so it has been successful. So we've still got a couple of minutes left. So. Um, so the stress test is, yeah, it's firing. So it's firing 100 requests. So it's running up 10, 10 vertex, vertex verticals, parallelism is 10. And it's each, each vertical is then issuing 100 requests at that service I've started. Um, and then the actual code is in there to do that. So the, the demo that I didn't do, that what that would have just shown you is it was showing you how to compose objects. So I'd have a taxi, I've got a theatre service, then I've got a taxi service running, and then I've got an alternative taxi service running. So you do your theatre, all in the same sim single transaction, transactional block, do your theatre theater booking, try your taxi booking. You might get an exception on your taxi booking and had it marked as like nested. So that would fail. And then you've got the option of then going trying an alternative taxi service. So I had three services running, and I go and do the alternative taxi service, and then you would commit the changes, and it would um, and then it would commit those changes to memory, and make them visible to any other threads, and that was showing the composition of like STM operations. OK. 
Okay, so, so let's skip over those ones. So if you want more information, you can go to our website. So that we are, it's, it's hosted by the Narayana Project. So if you go to like narayana.io and you'll find some web pages there. You've got forums, blogs. Um, you can get us on IRC as well. Um, the source of this demo is available as well. That's on our quick start repo. And the actual source of the um, STM system that Mark wrote is, um, is, is in our master tree under STM. So that wraps it up for the for the talk. So Q and A. Anybody got any questions? Right, so, S so STM isn't clustering. SEM is just managing shared memory state. So it's got one copy of the shared memory state for all these objects that have been cloned. So, you, so you've, you've got your one object, you say to the container, clone it for me, you get back a clone, but the underlying memory of the original object and the cloned object is managed by, by the STM container. The clustering is the vertex, is a vertex concept. So vertex has... Is do, you, um, oh, do you mean something like the hazel class, hazel cast clustering, or the infinite span clustering? Uh, yes, because yeah. uh, in fact, if you have uh, two different uh, JVMs and you are sharing uh, state between them, I assume that there so is some sort of clustering. There, there, there isn't as yet. But the advantage we have is that the transaction manager that infinite span uses is Narayana, so that is definitely something that we want to do. But we haven't got the integration with uh, with Infinispan yeah, at, at this stage. But it's an open source project. <laughs> get, <a l> <laughs> get involved. <laughs> yeah. Yes. There's no XA here for a start. There's no XA, there's no database. <laughs> so you don't have to have Oracle or DB2 or anything like that to, stay, to save your state. Yeah, so uh, on that... There's, there's no, you know, everything's done through, um, through annotations and the system is actually tracking as you access the, the objects and making sure that, you know, if you, if you move through a, an object that doesn't make any state changes, then it doesn't sa save any state. If you move through an object that does modify state, then it'll, it will save the state for you. But there's, there's no transactional access to a database involved. There's no XA access. So that's one of the big differences. Oh, oh, sorry. So the, the STM implementation is pure Java today. Um, one of the things we could look at is how we could do this in other languages. So the ver when Vertex moved from 2 to 3, so in, the, in Vertex 1 and 2, if you wanted to do a, like a nice utility in Java on Vertex 2 and you also wanted it to be av available in Scala, you had to re-implement that in Scala. One of the things they did in Vertex 3 was they actually did some automatic translation. So you only have to implement it in one language, and then it can be made available in the other languages. So we might do something similar. Oh, no. No, no, there's no JNI or anything. Yeah. Depends on the implementation. So we have different implementations for sharing state. Um, one of them could be, it could be through InfiniSpan. It's not through Infin InfiniSpan at the moment. It could be a uh, shared file. It could be memory mapped file. Um, the, the actual way in which you do the sharing of state between instances is itself pluggable. And we just haven't got around to doing the, uh, the InfiniSpan one yet. So if you're doing that, then you have to materialize it. Yes. All oh, right, okay, so you are, when you're... you're oh, yeah, 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 yeah. It depends on whether you set the object to be persistent or 
volatile. If it was volatile, like I said before, you'd lose everything. You'd lose the state. If it was persistent and it happened after the transaction had committed, then if the transaction committed, that's, it's, it's there. You will have that same state when you recover again. So you've got to complete the yes. File. Yeah. Okay. It's what transactions are all about, really. Yeah. Okay. Oh, I think, I think we're done, but if you, anybody wants to come and ask us a question afterwards, feel free.